I don't suppose any car this year will require less introduction than this. Come on, people, it's the new GT3. And so this is the new GT3 being driven up a hill somewhere in Europe. Wow, what to make of this car? Well, let's drive it fast and try and explain some of what's going on. I've got all the systems switched off at the moment. I've got the PDK gearbox in normal, that's what's advised. I've got the sports exhaust on and I'm shifting gear myself. This is quite a car. Revs to 9,000 RPM. Rear wheel steering, well, that's something new for me. The rear axle steering combines performance with everyday practicality. At low speed, the system steers the rear wheels in the opposite direction to that of the front wheels. This enhances agility in tight bends. During high speed maneuvers, the system steers the rear wheels in the same direction as the front wheels, thus increasing stability. Because if I do this, then the steering goes to absolutely fix. It's incredible the calibration work they've done. The chassis is a massive step on. We've got a wider front track. The car just turns so much better than the 997 version. I just think it's, well, it's immature, but it's, it's cool. It's just cool, isn't it? Poker steer is cool. This car is cool because of it. Because of the four wheel steer working now actively, it's much more agile, much more agile. Steering, well, we'll touch on that again in a minute. The steering is superb compared to the normal 991. There's a load more weight. I just feel more connected. Now, let that engine go. Eight, that's nine. The last 500 RPM. Wow. Just Wow. and direct fuel injection, DFI, featured in a 911 GT3 model for the first time. Just above ground level and low at the rear is the newly developed flat six engine which peaks at 9,000 RPM. Interestingly, when I'm driving like this, I'm not actually thinking where's my manual gearbox, but that does come. I assure you, that does come. This isn't quite one of our normal videos. It was a smash and grab effort shot on my own, hence the camera sitting in the passenger seat most of the time, because we had a chance to drive an engineering car very early and I grabbed it. But before we delve further, let's have a look around. You really need to see this thing in the flesh to appreciate how much punchier it looks than a base 991. That protruding chin line, the big splitter element and some gaping intakes give the 991 GT3 a menace that's missing in the base car. You'll need the optional front axle lifter in town as well. The car uses the wider 991 body shell, which is almost all aluminium, and the claimed curb weight is 1430 kilograms, which has got people screaming, it's too heavy. But then it does now have a PDK dual clutch gearbox as standard. Porsche claims it can shift in less than 100 milliseconds. There is no manual option. I'll repeat that, there is no manual option. The box itself is heavier, but the new motor is lighter than before. It's a 3.8 litre flat six based on the Carrera motor, and it produces 475 horsepower at 8,250 RPM and 325 foot-pounds of torque. The limiter is set at 9,000 RPM. The claimed 0 to 100 time is 7.5 seconds, which is nothing fast. The ring lap time is 7 minutes 25 seconds on both OE tyres, the Dunlop and the Michelin. These 
are the optional 20 inch forged rims which look achingly gorgeous and are beautifully dished at the rear. For the first time there is an OE Dunlop tyre measuring 30530 at the rear and 24535 at the front. The rear steering works in the opposite direction to the front wheels below 50 miles an hour and in the same direction above that speed. So at low speed you get a shorter wheelbase feeling and at high speed a longer wheelbase feeling for stability. However, the engine is just one ingredient. Let me list some of the others. It's got four-wheel drive, four-wheel steering, four-wheel anti-lock brakes. This is like a mobile version of Euro Disney. It has trick suspension, which tugs the car down on its haunches as the speed builds up. And it has what's called active aerodynamics. At 50 miles an hour, the rear spoiler changes shape to make sure the car is cleaving the air as neatly as possible. And while we're on the subject of four... The interior is pretty subtle. This car has the club sport pack which gives you a bolt-in rear cage and a fire extinguisher. The carbon buckets have fixed backs. All the control surfaces are Alcantara covered, except this engineering car has a leather wheel. And there's enough GT3 badging to remind you that you're not driving a Carrera, although you should be shot if the way this thing demolishes a road doesn't decide this for you. There are some funky GTR-esque gadgets too. This performance meter thing I didn't really understand. And the G-meter is a bit pointless too, but then people love toys. Me? I'm kind of more interested in the way the new GT3 drives. To facilitate this, the car features dynamic engine mounts. The electronically controlled system minimizes vibrations throughout the entire drivetrain. The stiffness and damping performance of the engine mounts is adapted to changes in driving style and road surface conditions. This is achieved through the use of a fluid with magnetic properties and an electrically generated magnetic field. The results are greater and more uniform drive force at the rear axle, increased traction, and faster acceleration. Another new feature in the new 911 GT3 is Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus with an electronically controlled fully variable rear differential lock. The benefits are clear, particularly at the limits of dynamic performance greater traction, and a significant improvement in stability under load changes and in tight corners. I've thought long and hard about how to approach this car, how I should approach it as a journalist, how I should approach it as a previous GT3 owner, as I should approach it as a GT3 fan. And I've reached this conclusion, I think I need to separate the factual from the philosophical, okay? So I'll deal with the factual first. This is what I see as the facts of the situation. A company like Porsche, any company that makes sports cars that's a sort of pioneer, a market leader, whether it's a Ferrari or a Maserati or a BMW, an Audi, a Mercedes AMG, they have to improve on the car that they replace, right? So the new GT3 had to identify what the old 997 GT3 did and do those things better. Lack of knowledge of those cars, because I spent quite a bit of time in them, and the way I saw it, the following things were not very good. The front axle grip at times wasn't what you wanted it to be. It was a bit of a problem. You found you had a lot of understeer. Getting the car into a corner was a problem. You had quite an aggressive differential that added to that understeer, but then gave you quite severe oversteer after that neutral point. So the front axle of the car was always a bit of a problem. Another problem is, that even though people like me loved the manual gearbox and felt it was the last of the great driver's cars, there were an unknown number of people, I say unknown, who wanted some paddles and didn't want a manual gearbox. And that's the way the market is inexorably going. So, factual situation is this. Porsche's fixed the front axle problems on this car through a combination of wider front track, a totally different set of kinematics and lower arms to a normal 991 Carrera. 
and this very clever rear wheel steer system. We can break down how it works and the way it does things, but the reality is on the road, you just don't notice it. You just have a steering wheel that when you turn the car, makes this car feel a whole load more agile and transparent and easier to go fast in. And how does it work? It's connected to a computer, which is connected to all the brains in the car. As soon as you get an input of the steering wheel and you're below, let's say, 80 kilometers an hour, the steering makes an angle which is opposite to the angle of the front wheel, so it's not in phase, it's out of phase. The result is the car is more agile. You can make digitally lane moves at 300 kilometers an hour without any sweat. There's no phase lag whatsoever. I got convinced by my guys because I didn't want to have that feature in the car. I couldn't believe the difference it makes because it's weight. It's about 5 or 5.8 kilos, just the system. And the other effect is it draws a lot of current. It needs a bigger battery. Batteries are heavy. So the whole system weight is about 15 kilos. And this for a GT3 is outrageously high. I didn't want to have that. But we made back-to-back -back comparisons with the car with and without, and even with the car that had it installed, I switched it off. And the car feels a lot more agile, feels a lot smaller with that, with that uh, rear axle steering, and it definitely has only advantages. They've got a 997 GT3 here, I just jumped into it, and it feels ancient by comparison. You can't believe how much arm work you've got to put in. So yes, in those terms, it's a massive result. mechanical hardware changes to this over a Carrera. It's just a calibration and software job. For the GT3, we have a totally revised uh, software on the, on, on the steering. And we did a lot of testing, a lot of testing. I don't know how many loops we went with that system to get it right at the end. But I promise you, definitely, quote me for it. Same goes for the engine, same goes for the steering. If you miss the old steering when you drive that car, call me. the feedback you need even on snowy conditions it's it's so it's so tactile it's it's like it's always was in a gt3 and uh, we really managed to get this system exactly on the same status it's it's a different world of electromechanical steering by hell if this steering doesn't appear on every single 911 soon i'd be amazed okay we've got different tracks we've got a different tire we've got different spring and damper rates we've got a solidly mounted lower suspension arms that all helps give us a better connection to the road but this is by far and away in fact by a, a margin i can't even explain better than any electric power steering i've ever driven it really is quite superb got a load more weight to it not once today have i thought i wish it had hydraulic steering and that's a surprise because i thought i would what about the engine well again factually once you've driven this thing, you'll forget the Metzger ever existed. I mean, it revs and revs and revs. Okay, it's only 500, 600 RPM more than last time, but that last 600 RPM, the noise, this sort of hard mechanical valve train noise that comes through, that is addictive, absolutely addictive. And it's a step change, it's something entirely new. Okay, it doesn't rattle and graunch and make quite as many characterable noises as before, but this doesn't feel very related to a 9A1 that comes straight out of a 991 Carrera. It feels very different, very different. How they're going to make it reliable to 9,000 RPM over 100,000 miles, I don't know, but they're Porsche, so 
I'm sure they will. We've got uh, we've got titanium rods. We've got a different crankshaft. We've got super lightweight uh, forged pistons. We've got an all new cylinder head, and the cylinder head is something. Uh, that is really, really standing out because we're using not anymore in the, on the drive train, on the, on the valve train, tappets. We use rocker arms, like on a motorcycle. And so it's very low mass, so we can, the oscillating masses are very low. That's why we can rev to 9,000 RPM without overstressing the chains and everything else in the car. And with the 475 horsepower, we have a specific output of 125 horsepower per liter. This is a very conservative figure. So the car really goes like hell and the added 500 RPMs the engine gives you are opening a whole new world. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a difference. The metallic sound of the, of the engine that it, that it makes at 8,500 RPM onwards, it's, uh, there's no such thing available. It's very emotional. We have an unsteady, impatient rumble at idle, like a Metzger engine. If you wouldn't know that there's not a very, very good revised Metzger engine in the back, you wouldn't notice. Let's talk about the transmission. Comfortably the best PDK that Porsche's ever made. Fast, intuitive, and just a step beyond in terms of what you can extract on the road in terms of performance, and for many people, I suppose, enjoyment. For me, maybe not. But let me try and alter my point of reference for a minute and pretend that I'm in the sports car market. I'm not, you know, David Coulthard. I'm not Mark Lieb. I'm a normal driver. Well. I can extract so much more performance from this car compared to its predecessor, you can't make a comparison. You just pull a lever, down two gears, I execute a perfect heel and toe, I'm into the turn because that front axle wants to turn, I've got an amazing traction from those massive rear Dunlops on this car, it's easy. It really is easy. And it's, do you know what, earlier I was going really quite fast on some technical roads. And I didn't once think I want a manual because I realized that if I had a manual, I'd almost have too much work to do. So um, this, this really works and it's more fun yeah. and it's more involving. And this is the important point than a manual. Why? Because we added some, besides the ultra fast shifting times, which are emotionally so something new because 9,000 RPM and a 100 millisecond second shift and this, this, this exhaust uh, bang that you get by that, it's, it's, it's simply, when you stand in the woods and the colleagues coming by uh, on a curvy road with a GT3, you think, really think that's a World Rally Championship car. If I have rainy weather, there's a second gear curve, nobody's around, no police, anything, and there's enough space all around, in a clutch car, I pull the clutch, second gear, when, when, let it go and go sideways and have fun. So do that in a PDK, that's a little bit yeah, trickier. So we needed a way to disengage the clutch completely, uh, to simulate letting go a the clutch, clutch of the foot. That's what we did with the pedals. If you pull both pedals, you're doing exactly the same thing. When, when, let it go, bang. Yeah? Really? So that's the donut mode, how we call it. <laughs> yeah? And you can do that with that car and there's some other features as well. If somebody is in the mood, he should be able to take off with more wheel spin than maybe necessary. It can be done as well without any computerized uh, input. So um, everything you can do with a normal manual, you can do with that too. And the automatic program, I mean, it's very specifically designed for that car. It doesn't shift down, up and down all the time. It shifts exactly at the same point in time. You can make bets with your co-driver. Okay, now and bang, it's coming. It's, it's almost miraculously. And, um, with every shift you make, you get an advantage of more than half a car's length. So shift two times, yeah. logically, before the next curve, you're, you're ahead of them. Where does that leave us? Well, it leads us to the philosophical question, and that's, should I be in a car with a badge that says GT3 on the boot and all this heritage and history, and not once have I changed gear myself in the time I've been talking to you? I've just left it in automatic and it's been doing it all for me. Philosophically, is that acceptable? Is that the way things should be? Hmm, I'm not so sure. 
I think this car objectively is everything I'd hoped it for, would be and, and better. You know, it's so fast, it makes an amazing noise. It just takes the game to a new level. But I think a GT3, or maybe not a GT3, but a car built by Porsche, the shape of a 911 with this engine, should be the last bastion of the manual gear change. I think it's a massive shame that they haven't made the car with a manual gearbox, but I can't, I can't beat up what I've got here because it's so good. It's such a good car to drive and it is so much fun. But I do miss the fact that it's not a manual and I think there is a small portion of the marketplace that will feel disenfranchised and might not go out and buy the car. My guess is that for every one that doesn't buy it, there might be three or four that do buy it because of what it's become. What does that tell me about the GT3? It probably tells me more about my beliefs in cars and what I want and how that doesn't sync with the marketplace than it does about the GT3, if I'm being honest with you. But when you're up it, when you're driving it fast and you step out of it, it is a piece of work.